Hey there, folks. Uh, welcome back to another episode of whatever this is. Today, we're going to be answering one question and one question alone. Hopefully, maybe, I don't know. And that is, how do you get your friends to, uh, to play a new system? Uh, why don't we start from, the, from the, a really small scale? Uh, John, you, the, the players at your table, you, you GM quite often, and you've known these people for, for a long time. What's your experience been like trying to get them to try a new game? I've had both successful and not as successful uh, times trying to get my players to try different systems or new systems. Um, the same group of players that I play with really often uh, have also tried new systems with different GMs that have like guest game mastered for us. Um, and I find that the times that are successful are when the GM has a very clear reason why they want to try a system versus like fifth edition D and D, which is the most popular one. And the ones that aren't as successful are when the players either don't understand or for whatever reason, don't agree to the reasons why we're, we're trying something new. So for example, a successful time uh, was with a system called Mechton, which is based off of Interlock, which is actually the same system. I believe that uh, cyberpunk, the TTRPG was based off of. And when I ran that for my players, I wanted to play a uh, real robot mech RPG, like Mobile Suit Gundam, um, was which that is the very one that we different. Played? What? Oh, uh, yeah. Was oh, that yes. The one that you, you ran for it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you played it too. Uh, I actually cool. I run that multiple times, but the the key reason I wanted to do it is obviously there's no magic in a sci fi real robot world. So the mechanics of that game, you can target individual limbs of the robots and stuff like like just what you're paying attention to mechanically is different than just a flat armor class that you're rolling to hit a time that was not as successful uh, was you were you and I did a play test with a guest GM that wanted to run a more rules light system. And the initial pitch was just that this game is more about the theater of the mind and it's players won't get stuck looking at a battle map. The the issue was that wasn't what they told us up front. It was more something that they revealed as we were in the middle of the game. And speaking to some of the players afterward, they're like, I don't know if I like this system because I like looking at a battle map. <laughs> so because there wasn't like this almost clear bulleted list of goals of why we're trying this new system, it was harder for them to appreciate some of the things the system did do. Okay. I guess that's just the, the first point is, why do you want to try a system? Are your players on board with the reasons for you to, to try that system? I don't even necessarily know that the goal always needs to be present, but you at least have to have players who are willing to experiment. And people can be in way different states of, of their TTRPG journey. So a lot of people have only played D&D. That's it. They don't even know of any other TTRPGs that exist outside that space. And comfort, familiarity can be can be kind of the the default. Um, and I think that's why we see a lot of homebrew in, in 5e too, is people don't want to branch out because there's cognitive load that they have to take on. There's uh, just a, a sheer time investment. And then also, I think you kind of wonder, like, if we're not going to continue playing the system, why should I, I invest? So I think there's a handful of different angles to, to kind of pursue it from. Just off of your comment about why there might be mixed reviews to trying a new system when, you know, there's a player missing or there's some sort of gap, um, it has to do with that cognitive load and also emotional continuity. So I don't know if you have had this similar experience, but uh, when I was a lad uh, and the way I got my anime was from Cartoon Network and Adult Swim, it would always be really jarring if I'd go to watch a, my regular midnight show and for one week there was something completely different where maybe it was, say, I don't know, Yu Yu Hakusho and they were in the middle of, you know, going through May's castle to fight the Saint Beasts and the previous episode ended on a cliffhanger. So you're like, oh, I'm looking forward to the next week. But then there's some sort of one shot program like, I don't know, Samurai Jack took up the entire weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, so now there's like you were expecting to resolve that cliffhanger. Your emotion is invested in that one thing. And you kind of can't let that 
go because that loop hasn't been closed to even enjoy the thing that you're introducing in the middle of maybe a longer story thing. Man, I just keep I keep thinking about like watching the, the flash on a CW and like how many times do you have to go back in time? Please stop. Stop doing it. Like I, <laughs> I'm really invested in in like your relationship with uh, with Iris West and yeah. and like please stop ruining that <laughs> or whatever. Like hey, so what I'm I'm hearing from that is just to to kind of like be aware of the timing mm. of of when to present that opportunity to to try a new system. You know, I, I really I like the idea. I'm I'm not sure how how sold I am on it nowadays, but I, I really like the idea of the core experience of, you know, TTRPGs just being just like sitting down and hanging out with friends and playing make believe. Realistically, there's more to it than that. Because, you know, we were like adults who all have different levels of, of investment and in, in what's going on currently, other things that we're thinking about too. And sometimes our games can be that escape from from everything else. And and because of that, it can't it can't often or it can't always be just like just hanging out and having fun. I mean, you know, that's I guess that's what board game nights are for, or what you know, uh, game nights are for. But at TGRPGs I, I feel like have it's easier to to get attached to something that's longer term. So when you say, hey, we're going to try out this new system, there can just be inertia to to overcome. What, what do you think about transitioning a table, uh, just like a table of players to a new system? Hey, we've run our course with, with 5e. The next campaign is going to be in this other system. Is there any way to, since we're seeing a lot of you know new games come out, what would be a good... Into, or a good approach to take into to that. So in my experience, uh, it's the same as when you have a new player that is interested in joining your group's dynamic, um, which is I would start with a series of closed loop one shots that each help teach the players what the main mechanics of the game are and have the design of those sessions emphasize like a different element without having to worry about all of the puzzle pieces moving together. Um, And the reason for that is if you tell some players, this is what we're going to do for the next 50 sessions or so, it's going to be too intimidating, especially if they find that they don't like it. Um, And I've definitely been at tables where let's say you have a GM and four players and everyone's bouncing off of each other and things are flowing really well and everyone's having fun. And then someone brings their friend or spouse to a game and all of a sudden it gets weird. You don't want to be in the middle of a campaign that has inertia and add that chaotic element into it because it can it can cost the game to fizzle. Um, And in the same way, as you're if you're introducing a new system that you want the table to commit to over a longer period of time, you want to test to make sure that the experience you're trying to build over a longer period of time isn't going to have unnecessary hiccups from players just not understanding the setting, the world, the rules, the mechanics, all those kind of things. I have experience watching it myself where a DM was trying to build a really cool, darker fantasy world um, with a lot of ambiance. And a lot of times it would get undermined by players not maliciously, they just didn't understand that this is not a goofy game. We're trying to do this more dramatic thing. And uh, it created a lot of unnecessary tension. Whereas I think if that GM had taken their time to build it up over time um, and taught their players their expectations through the gameplay a little more, I think over the longer term, it would have been a smoother experience. I I think the mechanics of the game are probably important too. And what what stage or your or what experience level your 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 uh, table is at? Imagine jumping from Five E to Pathfinder. I mean, Pathfinder is is considered a crunchier game. You know, it's based off of three point five, which was very obviously a crunchier game. Uh, people still consider D and D crunchy. So if if you know some of those players and think about how they eventually got acclimated to to a game, they might not be able to handle much more than that. You know, if if they were like having a hard time um, kind of getting into it. So Distal, just as an example, is like specifically designed for, for D&D players to be able to painlessly understand what's going on. 
Yeah, well, it's interesting you brought up Pathfinder because, um, you know, when the OGL debacle happened uh, early 2023, like a lot of people, I was also angry. (laughs) And I had the thought of, you know, would it be worth it to jump to Pathfinder to support, you know, a company that I, I think had better ethics at the time? Paizo has its own issues, <laughs> um, which I, I don't really want to get into or take a stance on. Just like, you know, there <laughs> it is. The good guys and bad guys in, in corporate interplays are not always clear cut. <laughs> so but um, that was one of the questions I, I was asking myself is, is there's a lot more to learn. Is it worth it to teach all of my players um, in order to convert them to this new system? And that was kind of when I learned the hard lesson of you need to kind of have multiple sessions, each with a very clear focus, because what I did is I took the beginner box, but I let the players all create their own characters. So I wasn't using the pre-made characters that were included in the box. Um, And it led to a lot of unnecessary confusion because I was biting off more than I could chew. Um, and it also, you know, the the story of Pathfinder is a crunchier system, which it is. Th- my players made that assumption going in. So a lot of times when something would go wrong, they're like, well, this is why we don't do it, because it's crunchier. So right. there yeah, was a I resistance to diving deep in and doing their homework because the story about the mechanics impacted their perspective more so than the mechanics I think actually did. Um, so it's kind of setting themselves up for for failure just based on the perceptions of you know, they're they're walking in into. So if you yeah. would go back in time, would you would you start them with the pre generated uh, characters? Absolutely, I would, and I probably okay. um, would have only done the first two fights in in that beginner box adventure. There's like eight or nine fights, which are beautifully designed like to demonstrate how like the first fight is just learning how attacks work the second fight is learning how terrain works the third fight is learning how resistances and weaknesses work like it does such a beautiful job of layering on like the core elements that come up in combat um the the issue was my players are also having trouble navigating their player sheet um and so they're they they didn't quite absorb the sequential lessons that the adventure was designed to teach. And that was on me. That was my fault. I wasn't, I wasn't super good at the Pathfinder mechanics. I hadn't run myself through the adventure first. Um, I, again, I just bit off more than I could chew. I, uh, I did a video uh, a while back talking about Peril and Pinebrook, which is a uh, D&D 5e mini a very straightforward adventure. It's meant for, ar- arguably, I think it's fine for people our age, but arguably it's meant for uh, people who are younger or like, you know, in school and, you know, learning D&D for the first time and it boils down a lot of the mechanics. For example, you don't roll uh, anything other than D6 uh, in a, for for attacks, rather, um, and your your D20 to, to hit. So all the weapons, so like, what, short sword, D6, um, hand axe d6 you know it was it was designed all the pre-generated characters were designed in such a way that you only need two dice to play this game so immediately very intentionally uh crafted experience because it's catering to just fresh new players and there's a reason why quick starts exist and i i think that we especially like as experienced players would have a perception of just like i want to do all the fun stuff but realize that people aren't there with us necessarily because we, you know, we're the the DMs, the GMs, we're the the home brewers, and you know, we're we're overly invested in these experiences. Uh, a lot of players are just trying to play the game, and they they may also want to create characters in the new system, though. And I I feel like you should probably stop them from doing that. Make that the second session. A session for a lot of systems can just consist of you designing a character, and I don't think that's where you. You want to end up you want to jump right into play so that you can feel things out and um and just start having fun creating a character it can be fun it can also be a slog and uh, a lot of systems have a lot going on with their mechanics and you just get choice paralysis and that sort of thing so don't set yourself up for failure start from simplicity and 
uh, try to acclimate you know, people to that system. And it, it, that could be difficult too, because if you're only intending to run a one shot, you might not get the full experience from um, if you're starting just small. But if you look for a quick start, it is specifically built to like acclimate you to the game and get you having fun as quick as possible. That's the whole reason that a quick start exists. So my advice would be to, to do that for sure. Also, quick start exists for distal if you want to give it a shot. Shameless plug. Yeah. <laughs> um, so to also compliment Peril and Pinebrook, the very smart thing uh, that that adventure does when I read it was it broke down like time. <laughs> so this part of the adventure should take about 10 minutes. This part of the adventure will take about 20. So yeah. and I think that TTRPGs... You know, that, that's what I ran into with my group is like you mentioned, we're all adults. We all have busy lives and packed schedules. We can't just block off a Saturday night and say we play until we end. We need like a specific block of time that we can relax into it, but also trust that the game will resolve by then. So there's like a really smart habit that it's sneakily building in, which is consider how long things actually take. Um, as opposed to how long we convince ourselves it will take. Uh, there have right. been plenty of times I've had a GM be like, this will be a three hour session and five and a half hours in it's because, oh, that combat was only supposed to take 20 minutes. Right. It's like, well, <laughs> how long have your combats traditionally taken? So there's a huge element of if you're going to successfully convert a table you need to be really aware and observant of the actual time spent and your players' actual behaviors instead of what you think their behaviors are going to be. Um, a good example of that is Call of Cthulhu. I had a GM very excited about Call of Cthulhu and, and they wanted me to give it a shot. And the reason was the system, according to them, incentivized deep immersion, uh, meaningful decision-making, and as they were explaining how the mechanics did that, I'm like, I feel like a lot of players would just not invest. If they know their, their character is going to die, they're not going to think of it as a meaningful decision. They might just think of it as a throwaway character. And the GM was very adamant I was wrong. And then I heard an interview by Brendan Lee Mulligan who confirmed what I said. And my, my point isn't that that design is good or bad. It's... People are unpredictable and they're observable. So when you introduce a mechanic, it's not they should react this way. It's I've introduced the mechanic. How are they going to react to it? Right. If you're a GM who is constantly trying to convince players to play something that you want to play, or like if you're like the ringleader um, that's trying to like corral all the cats or whatever all the time, it'll depend table to table. But I feel like you might have a harder time getting your players to try something new if you're already having scheduling conflicts for your your existing game. One thing that I think about is uh, what sort of outside influences could you have? Like what, ha what would happen if you were to ask your players what they would like to play next? We know that somebody is going to be out next week. What kind of game uh, system did you have an interest in running? If that uh, question is coming from you, if that idea to play something new is coming from somebody else, oftentimes there's there's some power in that. Uh, another shameless plug re real quick. In the, the campaign for, for Distal, there was an add-on that you could purchase where we'll schedule a game, I'll play with you, you know, and, and introduce your, your players to to the game. Yeah, we'll we'll get it all, you know, set up on a calendar and that sort of thing. The the goal of having that add-on, aside from the upsell, which is, you know, important too, is is that there is a lot of friction when it comes to trying to convince players, tables, to move to a new system. And having an outside voice or being able to have that leverage to say like, I scheduled a game with the author, uh, you know, do you want a seat, is a little bit of a different uh, sell than, hey, we're going to hang out and, and try, you know, to, we're going to try to figure out something new. The investment is different. Yeah, Absolutely. Asking questions is one of the best ways to kind of engage people differently. So um, in my career as a professional martial arts instructor, you got a, an eight year old um, in a stance. You get a very different result if you say, you know, point your feet in this direction versus asking them which direction should your feet be pointed. 
um, it just causes their brain to process it a little bit differently. Um, and, and questions are very powerful. And a lot of times the answers you get are going to be better than the answers that you came up with. That's always been one of my secret joys of GMing is when I'm in the middle of running some sort of story and I kind of have an idea of where the plot might go. And then through some kind of question or some kind of circumstance, a player is like, I bet the bad guy is actually this. And I sit there like, oh, that's a much better idea than whatever I had come (laughs) up with. Yeah. So a lot of times, uh, like you mentioned, even board games, like to get that feeling of just hanging out and having fun. You know, sometimes if you ask, like, what would you rather do? Because we have a player down. If a player's like, oh, I want to try this new card game. Like, Mm. yeah, it doesn't have to be the TTRPG, but because it came from them, everyone's more likely to be able to have a fun time with it. Things start to break down when when people start to miss sessions and you can't do something else. I know GMs that will adamantly, like, always play even if you're missing, they say like, if we're down or if we have at least, you know, two people, we're going to continue to play and they structure their campaign in such a way that, that, uh, that they can cope with that. But the point is to, to create that rhythm because it's comfortable to say like, ah, I'm probably not going to have time anyway, or like, ah, you know, it's probably not going to be as much fun without X person being here. And I, I think that you know, creating some sort of uh, expectation that can be met, you know, week after week after week, like it can help push your your games forward and you know maybe just by virtue of doing that try you know new things out too it absolutely can now this is where i'm going to diverge from probably a lot of the community i found success in the opposite approach which is when we run a session the session has a beginning middle and end and i really avoid cliffhangers as much as possible a lot of players aren't going to like that. So, and I totally understand that. Um, Just my experience has been because I know players will be like that where they'll just bail on a session out of nowhere. What I do is I I close it so there's not that open loop. It's almost like an episode of Cowboy Bebop instead of Yu Yu Hakusho where it's its own standalone isolated thing. And that way I can kind of mix players up. And if a player isn't able to make one session, I can plug another player in. So even though a lot of times there are um, narrative threads that you can see built up session after session, kind of like the MCU where like, you know, each movie, there's an Easter egg that teases the next movie, but each movie is still for the most part, its own thing that has helped my game continue over the years without breaks and with the same group of players because if one if something comes up one player has a baby you know it you're that their absence isn't going to halt the story too badly when i have recently i ran a session that was a three-parter there was a cliffhanger that stalled the game more than anything else that's happened over the past few years Mm. Uh, you know when you when you speak about it like that the the thought that was consistently uh, running through my mind was that you shouldn't have to punish your entire group because somebody's missing. So if you have like players who are super invested and they don't get to play, then, then you move in the wrong direction. Right. I think we're a little off the topic of introducing players to a new game, but consistency matters because of, you know, just everything that surrounds the periphery of tabletop uh, role-playing games in general. So having a, a consistent group will likely get you, to the the new system, you know, faster than uh, than having a, a really flaky group will. I think it also begs the question. I'm I'm gonna get a little broad before we get specific again. Of okay. like, when you're thinking system, like, what is the system? And the reason I ask that is, to me, the thing I just mentioned about how our group's frequency of play. And how we always try to like resolve a story inside of the single session instead of a cliffhanger. To me, that's as much part of the system as the mechanics in the book. So as much as it is action, bonus action, movement for what your character can do in turn on a combat, as much of it is the agreement of, you know, how often are we going to play? Um, What time of day are we going to play? Because I can tell you right now, playing 8 p.m. on a Saturday night, very different feel than 11 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. So all these 
uh, peripheral parts uh, have an impact on the system. And I think a lot of times when we're thinking about trying a new system, we're thinking, you know, trying a new core rule book as opposed to trying to like change those peripheral elements to get a different result. But also I, I do acknowledge that, yes, it is hard to change people to a new core rule book, a new system. TTRPGs are such an interesting experience because they have that social layer on the top. So that does include things like scheduling, our interpersonal relationships, uh, how how good a game will make somebody feel even, you know, if you come home from work and uh, in the game is about making really awful decisions, then uh, maybe that doesn't make you happy, you know, um, that maybe that's not the, the way to to offload that stress. Uh, so having to, to consider the real humans is, I, I agree, it's, it's just as much of the system, even if it's not uh, written into the book, which I believe you can design for it, um, move in that direction. And I think we both are. Yeah, well, and to complement Pathfinder, it is interesting, right? In its introduction, it's like gaming is for everyone. You know, don't uh, ex be exclusive, like with people in terms of you know, like age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, uh, ability, like all those different things. So, uh, it is thankfully, I think, moving in that direction. So earlier, I brought up an example where. We had a we had a guest GM run a rules light game for us. The promise and why they were so excited to run it is in their experience, they found the storytelling much more immersive because there were less rules to get in the way. And character creation, like it was a lot easier to fulfill a concept you had in your head. What was interesting is after the fact, what uh, one of the players said to me is it's just D and D it's just different dice. And it was because our experience with D and D was that as a GM, my style is a lot of times I ignore rules. Like if it's in the book, I'm like, eh, that one isn't contextually appropriate. So we're just going to ignore it. <laughs> so it really, the experience of D and D that I offer to my table a lot is very skill-based so it's like, you know, I've got a plus seven in investigation. I have a minus one perception or something. So it's really just what's your character's role in the party? What, you know, how are their strengths and flaws going to add to the scene of a story? Whereas with this game, it was a little bit, it, it was the same experience. It's just instead of adding a lot, we were just, rolling different sizes of dice so it but the loop was the same it was i roll a dice i compare the result to a target number and my game master narrates the results D D in my player's experience is largely the same way we roll a dice get a result and i'd say what happens so there wasn't anything super notable uh in this game the way the GM ran it, so I'm not talking about the design, I'm just talking about the specific implementation that made it more immersive than what they had gotten used to with my style. I remember that specific game. And I, I think me mechanically, uh, it didn't fulfill a desire for me. It was interesting to, to try something new as somebody who enjoys, you know, trying uh, new games. And... Uh, and I kind of found myself appreciating the structure of D and D because it was heavier um, on the on the rules side, and because I like to break those rules, you know, wherever it, it makes sense or like push the boundaries and, and that sort of thing. That's that's the fun part of the game for for me. So when it's just kind of like more loose and you're making up too much, or you can kind of you know do whatever you want, uh, it doesn't give me a fun puzzle to solve. So so maybe. I, I mean, it just goes back to, you know, figuring out the, the needs of your your players and what experience you're trying to offer. Well, it was also really enlightening because if we hadn't had the rules light experience, we didn't really enjoy as much. It would be harder to appreciate the things the system we do like has to offer. So and that that can be just as powerful as I, I call the Pathfinder playtest a failure 
in that we are not successfully converting to Pathfinder. But what it did do was it highlighted very specifically points that my my players are likely to get tangled up in, you know, rules clarifications that confuse them. So it makes it easier to run the system that I'm used to because now by running a different system, the, the benefit is that I can easier predict ways that they're going to get caught up and kind of smooth out those rough spots ahead of time. All right. Well, thank you very much, folks, for, for hanging out. Hopefully you found something of a, a value from this uh, conversation. And if you have had success or the opposite of that uh, in bringing your table to a new system or just trying to play something new for fun, let us know in the comment section down below. Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.